to you. Thank you very much, Isabel, and welcome everyone. My name is Dan Gibson, and I am the project manager for the Mori Initial Development and Demonstration Project. Over the past two years, my primary focus has been on helping to bring the vision of Mori to life. Now, that was to develop a modular system of self-contained transportable laboratories and supporting infrastructure that could be flexibly deployed on a wide range of non-specialized vessels. Of course, that was just a start. The real end goal was to transform these non-specialized vessels into instruments of large-scale oceanography. And most important was to provide opportunities for researchers to conduct leading edge science at sea. And that is pretty much what we were able to do. Uh, today, I am really quite excited because we are going to hear from leading scientists from the five scientific missions that made up the Mori demonstration seasons of 2021 and 22, 2022. And hear about some of the science that was accomplished during those missions. Each presentation will be approximately eight to 10 minutes in length, followed by a two minute um, Q and A period. During that time, uh, feel free to raise your virtual hand or uh, write a question in the, in the uh, chat box and we'll take care of it then. Once complete, those presentations will be followed by a panel discussion led by Dr. Doug Wallace to look at some of the future issues associated with research vessels in Canada, which inevitably will be very exciting indeed. Just before we get started with the science presentations, I have just a very, very short uh, presentation on the logistics associated with uh, getting a non-specialized vessel ready for a research cruise. To help me with that, I have a presentation here, that a very short presentation that I will try to share, share screen, and that should be Should be something that you can all see, correct? Yes, it's perfect, Dan. Excellent. Okay. The most successful research cruises are usually those that are planned with much consideration given to logistical issues and crew preparation. Now, I would suggest that that statement is relatively accurate for most cruises. However, the situation is quite different. If you are preparing to mobilize your mission on board a custom oceanographic research ship or a non-specialized craft of opportunity. And here's why. These two photographs are representative of how we how we, Mori, received the Atlantic Condor just one week prior to the planned start of our first scientific mission in 2021, and again, uh, first mission of 2022. As you can see, other than the ROV system and the large deck crane, what we received was essentially 600 square meters of clear, wide open, empty deck space. There were no custom laboratories, no built-in CTD systems, no winches, no A-frames, or any other supporting infrastructure that would be typical of a custom oceanographic ship. Not only that, we had limited fresh water on board, or on deck, I should say. We had limited electrical outlets. In fact, if the ROV system was to be used, there was insufficient power on the vessel to supply the power needs of all of our Mori modules. 
which obviously is a bit of a challenge. Now, this was no surprise. We knew pretty much exactly what we were going to get. So the key was to start the planning process very, very early so that we could hit the ground running as soon as the vessel arrived. Now, starting early, which that, that means starting the communication process with the, uh, the scientific teams organizing their missions very early, because it was imperative that we understood the whole scope of the scientific mission and what equipment was going to be required in order to execute their objectives. Not only that, we had to understand what equipment we had and what we didn't have. And then, of course, we had to decide on whether or not we could design and build equipment, purchase equipment, borrow, lease, or what any what other options may have been available. And once we had an idea of the, the scope of all the equipment, then, of course, we had to put everything together in project schedules and, more importantly, follow those schedules to make sure that everything arrived before the start of the, of the mission, ideally some time before the start. But it wasn't just the, the designing and uh, building of the equipment. We also had to, to figure out how everything was going to be installed on board the vessel so that it met the appropriate uh, requirements and also how they would be all integrated together so things work together um, as, as a unit. Now, once we had that, the next thing was to actually prepare for the mobilization efforts and the eventual demobilization of the ship. Now that meant uh, planning for uh, all of the, uh, the the trades and equipment that was going to be required uh, for the uh, for the mobilization, including uh, fabrication and welding support, electrical installation personnel, hydraulic hookup services, and of course the uh, the, the the trucks, uh, the transportation, and personnel lifts, forklifts, cranes, and so on and so forth. Now, if that wasn't enough, we also had to work in parallel with the scientific teams, so that they could uh, mobilize all of their instrumentation prior to the, the start of the cruise. And in some cases, that was really quite a significant effort. Again, the, the key is to uh, work together with those teams with clear and open communication throughout the whole process. What we were able to achieve is illustrated in this uh, photograph here, which shows the makeup, the layout of the Mori system for our second uh, demonstration season in 2022. Now, I don't want to infer that this was uh, a very straightforward, simple process. Uh, quite the contrary, in fact. There were uh, a number of um, factors in the equation and, and of course when that's when that's the case there were a few hiccups along the way some minor and some that were a bit more challenging nevertheless uh, working together as a team we were able to uh, solve those issues and more importantly use those issues as a, a learning experience uh, to help improve future uh, iterations of this type of system and in fact what you're looking at in this photograph is considerably different than the setup we had in the 2021 demonstration season, primarily because of the lessons learned during that time. This was, uh, at least for me, uh, at the very beginning, uh, a fairly uh, daunting uh, process. But in the end, what we were able to demonstrate by uh, working together, demonstrate collectively, is that it is very possible, very feasible to transform these non-specialized vessels and 
provide opportunities for scientists to continue their research at sea. And that, I don't want to take too much time away from the science presentations, but that is just a very, very brief overview of the, of some <laughs> of the logistic issues associated with getting that vessel ready for your science missions. If there are no questions, and Isabel, do we have any questions in the chat box? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay, perfect. Then I would like to introduce Dr. Daria Adamanchuk. Uh, Daria is a research associate at Dalhousie's Cirque Ocean Laboratory and was chief scientist on two uh, research cruises, one in 2021 and 2022. Over to you, Daria. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for introduction and also thanks for a nice uh, presentation leading up to my uh, science presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And I'm going to Okay, um, I hope you see my screen, my presentation screen. Perfect. Yes, all good. Thank you. Uh, I'll also try to be uh, short. Eight minutes is not enough to describe what we did uh, during these two cruises, but also leading uh, and all the preparations leading to these uh, two, actually two and a half cruises. Um, so I'll, um, I was thinking how would I frame my um, talk today? And uh, I think that the, the objectives of the research we're doing is to promote better option observing using autonomous platforms. And I hope to explain you why um, uh, MORI infrastructure and MORI project was instrumental in achieving this goal. So the Ocean Science and Technology Group at uh, Dalhousie University is looking at the development and the use of the new sensor and platform technology to observe processes and phenomena in situ. And these include biological carbon pump, IRC exchange, observing of, observation of uh, biogeochemical AUVs, their transport and distribution. And to achieve that, uh, we, we use multi-parameter, multidisciplinary time series collected uh, by the processes, or collected by the, the platform, sorry. Um, and we are looking at the process studies that allow us to parameterize uh, the process, so to explain it in terms of uh, mathematical equation, for example, but also this time series uh, allow us to uh, characterize uh, the process, so to quantify it uh, in order to better uh, predict it, for example, in the future, but also um, to verify the existing um, models that, that, that use parameterization that were derived in the process studies, for example. So if you think about where the observation lie in this ocean formation value chain, which is actually not a chain, is a, is a pyramid, and uh, observations, ocean observations are at the bottom of it, so uh, if we have any gaps in this foundation or our or all our value chain that goes from observation to the model analysis, um, production of the products, and then finally decision making and actions, if there are any gaps in this ocean observing uh, capacity that we have, then we have a big problem. And traditionally, we started with uh, you know discrete samples going on a research vessels collecting water using Niskin bottles. And then later, it being complemented by um, imagery from uh, from the space, uh, from collecting data using buoys and moorings, underway systems, gliders, floats, uh, autonomous vehicles, and then Argos and bi Argos. And all of these, except for the satellite one, will require the research vessels in some capacity, either to deploy them or to conduct the studies. So. Um, so our need for research vessels or the research platforms is, is, is there. Um, and also, um, I should also mention that we are only expanding our ocean observing capacity, but we cannot substitute one by the other. So discrete samples have their own value as well as the 
data delivered by the gliders, drones, and ROVs, for example. Uh, so I will just show two examples of the platforms we are working with. Uh, the Sea Cycler platform is a large oceanographic mooring that has uh, about 13 sensors listed here. Uh, and its uh, uniqueness is in profiling capacity of the upper, uh, uh, upper water column. Deployment of this platform is extremely complex and not even not all of the research vessels are capable to deploy it. So we wanted to make sure that um, Mori, if Mori uh, ship can deploy this platform, that will be a, a great advantage to us. Uh, and also adjusting to this more in a slightly simpler version, the biogeochemical package, which is still require a large infrastructure such as winches and, and, and A-frame to deploy it. And the other uh, platform I'd like to <clears throat> focus on here is the wave glider. And you, you would ask me why we need a ship uh, for the wave glider work. And uh, you will see later in my presentation why is that. So we use wave glider with the biogeochemical package in order to answer the question of the role of continental shelves and the carbon uptake uh, from, especially here on the Canadian East Coast. Uh, and from, from the previous work, it's been shown that there is a large discrepancies between the estimated air sea flux uh, from the model and observation, but also uh, depending on the type of observations, there is also large discrepancies in the calculated. Flux. So what is shown is that uh, there is a huge importance of uh, spatial temporal resolution of the measurements. So our first cruise uh, was uh, in 2021. It was, a, I wouldn't say a maiden cruise, but it was first cruise where we tried to use uh, Atlantic Condor as a research vessel. And we did a number of um, different activities uh, during this cruise. We did extended Halifax line all the way to the Gulf Stream. We deployed and recovered the moorings, showing the uh, capacity of the ship to do that. We also shown the flexibility of the platform like Atlantic Condor to adapt to different weather conditions. Um, so uh, the, the during the first maiden cruise, the configuration of the ship wasn't ideal. So we had the A-frame um, working on on uh, on the side of the ship, not on the stern. Uh, but we still managed to deploy and recover the moorings in that configuration. And also, CDD work wasn't um, again a conventional one. We had to use an a frame, um, a, a crane, sorry, um, and uh, it was quite laborious. Uh, process. However, uh, we succeeded and collected uh, a, a number of uh, chemical and bio biological parameters during this cruise. Um, working on the East Coast uh, in the middle of the hurricane season uh, has its pros and cons. One of the uh, cons, of course, is, is the need to plan um, the deployment mission so that uh, you don't uh, go in there in the middle of the hurricane. and. Um, the con, the, the pros of it is that it gives us an opportunity to observe the effect of the storms on uh, on the water column. And here I'm just showing uh, uh, profiles of um, some of the properties before and after the storm that we recorded during this cruise. It also gave us opportunity to test new sensors and to 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 observe the effect of. Um, of passing the hurricane on, for example, in this case, total alkalinity. Uh, this year's cruise was better planned. As, as Dan said, the key to success is to have better planning and better uh, and, and started earlier. Uh, but still, uh, if we're doing uh, work in the middle of the hurricane season, we have to be flexible. Uh, so this time we combined uh, three different missions during the, the our second year Mori cruise. Uh, we deployed the moorings uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the squash and shelf, uh, and they will stay there until March. So we hope to recover them next year. We also did some, uh, uh, provided some help in deploying the, the tags for the DFO halibut mission, and also we started the T-Rex tracer hunt. So uh, as I said, the, this year's cruise was better suited to, to what we needed to do in terms of infrastructure. The A-frame was mounted at the stern, and then containerized CTD enabled us, enabled us to do 
uh, proper uh, CDD sampling that didn't require much of the um, um, power. And then uh, the last I would like to mention and that, that speaks to the flexibility of uh, Mori is that Again, after our, our cruise finished, uh, there was another hurricane Fiona passing and um, because of the time crunch, we didn't have uh, enough opportunity to test our moorings. So we deployed them, but there is a, a number of steps that need to be done after the moorings are deployed, include, including acoustic ranging. So we had to go back and do this work, but also um, there was a um, wave glider in the middle of the storm on the Scotian shelf and then it needed uh, a rescue mission, and uh, conveniently, the, uh, the the Atlantic Condor was transiting from Halifax to St. John's, and on very short notice, they were able to accommodate our request for uh, for this work with the moorings, but also with the glider mission uh, rescue. Um, so we were able to recover the glider, not in its best shape, but uh, we we collected uh, a number of really good parameter and, and data sets uh, during this storm uh, will give us an insight about uh, insights in, uh, into the uh, biogeochemistry uh, and how it changes before and, and uh, during and after the storm. And I think I will stop here um, and like to thank you. And if you have any questions about the, uh, the cruises and how we did, please feel free to put them in the chat, I guess. Are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat for now, but uh, let me check if anyone has their hands up. What was up now? Okay, well then, thank you very much, Daria. That was very interesting. Sounds like you were able to collect a substantial amount of, of data. It was also nice to hear that the evolution of the Mori configuration was beneficial to your to your mission. So that's uh, that's always a good thing. Uh, sorry to hear about running into hurricanes both years, but uh, maybe next year it will not be in September. So good luck with your next mission. <laughs> Next, we will have a video presentation from uh, Dr. Uh, Jackie Zorez. Uh, Jackie is a, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary, where she works with uh, Dr. Uh, Casey Hewitt. Uh, her presentation is going to focus on activities from the very first Maury cruise in the summer of 2021. So I think the presentation is is ready to go, and uh, let's uh, oh. let's enjoy. Yeah, just give me a second. I have to remove the headset, otherwise you're not gonna hear. Okay, let me just. Uh, oh. oh. I uh, just need to go first. Sorry about that. Okay. Ready. Hello, my name is Jackie Zorris, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Dr. Casey Hubert's geomicrobiology group at the University of Calgary. Today, I'm going to be presenting on our Mori research expedition aboard the Atlantic Condor in the summer of 2021, where we performed in situ DNA sequencing with the aim to steer the ship with science. In August 2021, myself, Casey Hubert, and our colleague Anna Brand Chakraborty were the University of Calgary contingent on the inaugural Mori expedition. Our aim was to sample marine sediment and analyze the microbial community at sites of potential hydrocarbon seepage on the Scotian slope. We visited the sites shown in the map on the bottom left-hand corner. 
We collected marine sediments using a remotely operated vehicle and push cores that we assembled on deck, as shown here. We then loaded and secured the push cores into baskets, which were then placed in a larger elevator attached to an A-frame and a winch system. And this was then lowered over the side of the ship to the sea bottom. So as I mentioned, the push core sampling was done with an ROV, which was supplied by Helix Robotics out of the US. And the ROV had its own A-frame and winch system, which was used to transport it over the side of the ship. Um, and it also had its own container for operations, which is shown, or the inside of which is shown on the left-hand side here. So the ROV was equipped with many cameras, and this slide is just showing a few stills from the seafloor. We targeted sites for sampling that were reminiscent of the majority of the seafloor with minimal input of organic carbon, um, as shown here in the right two images. Um, and these were considered background sites. But we were mainly looking for sites that suggested input of organic carbon or hydrocarbons, which had a lot more biological activity and are shown here in the left two images. So this is just a video of the ROV sampling that I took while watching the ROV operators work. Um, you can see that there's a number of different camera angles and screens that the ROV operators are using to control the ROV. Um, and you can also see on this, on this screen that I've zoomed into the, the arm of the ROV, and it's slowly push, pulling out one of the push cores that it had recently placed. Um, and this push core just contains our marine sediment sample, and it is slowly, carefully bringing it back to the silver basket, where it will gently place it back in the basket and then go about collecting the remaining few push cords that are still there. Um, you can see in this site that there's quite a bit of biological activity. You can maybe see in some of these other screens that there's bubbles that are actually kind of emitting from or being released from the marine sediment itself. So it's quite an active, potentially um, active hydrocarbon seepage site. Um, so one of the sites that we were definitely most interested in. So once the push cores had been brought back onto the deck, we went about kind of deciding who got which sample um, in the process that we came to term the mud market. Uh, there was a few interested parties in these, in these samples, including groups from SMU, as well as um, APT and the University of Calgary. And so based on our and what we were looking for, we would decide what cores went to what group. Um, once we selected our core, we then went about subsampling it. So about every four centimeters, we took a subsample, the majority of which we stored and brought back to Calgary. Um, but we also took some for some analysis on board. Um, and these two images here are showing what the consistency of the sediment looked like. The majority of the sediment was kind of this thick clay-like material, um, but then the more biologically active um, sediment was this sulfitic, really bad smelling, kind of black liquidy material. Our primary goal for this expedition was to collect samples and bring them back to the University of Calgary. But our secondary goal was to steer the ship with science, which we aim to do through sequencing DNA from fresh samples that we extracted on board while the expedition was still ongoing. The idea here is that if our analysis of the sequencing data showed the presence of interesting microbial species of interest, we could theoretically inform the captain that we would like to revisit those sites. Whether or not he would listen to us is another issue. So these images show the inside of our bio container, which contained all the materials needed for DNA extraction and amplification, including a PCR machine, materials and reagents for DNA extraction, and a UV hood. We also had to create an analysis workflow to analyze the resulting sequence data that could work without internet on a standard laptop. The real reason that we could even attempt to do onboard sequencing was the recent invention of the nanopore minion sequencer, which I'm loading here on the left. Until recently, DNA sequencers were large, finicky, expensive machines that you wouldn't be able to do to bring with you during fieldwork. 
The nanopore mini sequencer, however, is extremely portable and connects to a laptop through just a USB drive, as shown here on the right. So perhaps surprisingly, we were actually able to accomplish the sequencing on the ship. Um, so in less than 12 hours from collecting the sample, we were able to analyze the data. We had a, um, a set of kind of hydrocarbon indicator species, um, so sequences that we knew were belonging to these organisms more often found in hydrocarbon seep areas. Um, so we use that as a database and searched our sequences against those, and we could kind of come up with this index that showed which sites had the most potential to be um, hydrocarbon seep sites. Um, and then we also could just do a broad community classification of all the organisms or the microbes that were present in these samples. After the success with sequencing at sea, we had some kind of standard follow-up questions including how much could we trust these results that we obtained with nanopore sequencing, um, specifically because nanopore sequencing is known to have a higher error rate um, than normal standard methods of DNA sequencing. Um, so in other words, how does the nanopore sequencing compare to this uh, Lumina sequencing that's standard in microbiology? Um, and so we did some follow-up experiments to address this um, over the past year and a bit. And this has recently been published as a preprint um, on BioArchive called Did You Seek an Offline Protocol for Rapid and Remote Nanopore Amplicon Sequence Analysis. So you can check that out if you want more information. So I'm not going to go too much into the paper at all, but I'm just going to share this figure, which is showing the abundance of certain microbial taxa sequenced um, from with Illumina technology compared to sequence with nanopore technology um, and showing a fairly high correlation level. So long story short, there's methods are pretty comparable. There are discrepancies, however, between certain taxa, um, which again, if you're interested, you can read more about in the preprint. One of the main outcomes of this project was the development of this analysis workflow called SituSeq which is used for the offline analysis of this nanopore generated 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon data. Um, and it's now been hosted on or posted on my GitHub page. Um, and it's written primarily in R and it's um, developed so that it's very easy to use. So if you're in the market for something like this, feel free to check it out. Basically, given um, the input of your sequence data, it will tell you what's in your sample based on different taxonomic levels and then generate these plots. Um, so like a stack bar plot or a bubble plot. Um, and I will also output the, the information as CSV files. And secondly, you can also supply your own sequences of interest. Um, so the user can create a custom database containing the organisms of interest for a search. And then you can search your nanopore sequences against this custom database and the code will summarize a number of hits per sample for you. So that's all I have today. Um, I would like to thank the members of my research team, my supervisor, Casey Hubert, uh, Chief Scientist, Robbie Bennett, and the crew of the Atlantic Condor. I'd also like to thank our various funders shown here, um, especially Mio Parr and Mori. Um, unfortunately, no one from our group is here to answer questions, but if you would like to follow up, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and my email is shown in the bottom here. So thank you all for listening. Well, that was a very interesting presentation, and the video was uh, very nicely done. Thank you very much, Jackie. Now, we did not plan on questions for this session, but I do believe I saw Jackie and perhaps some members of her team online uh, participating in the session. So if there are uh, any questions, perhaps we could get an answer from them. Okay, Jackie says, yes, we are here. <laughs> oh, yes, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is no question in in uh, the chat box as of now. Um, okay. 
then then we could move on. I think we're pretty much on schedule here, so that's a, that's a good thing. Our next presenter is Dr. Owen Sherwood. Dr. Sherwood is a, an associate professor at Dalhousie University and was lead scientist for another exciting cruise using an ROV focused on the investigation of the deep sea coral habitat. Over to you, Owen. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Dan. Give me a second here. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, looks good. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Thanks very much for the opportunity to, to present. So, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a, a, a flu, so my, my voice is not not the best at the moment. I'll I'll try to I'll try to, to project my voice as much as I can. Uh, so this was a, a coral and sponge habitat cruise that we did um, over August 8th to 19th uh, last summer, um, and I'm I'm showing the uh, our, our onboard science crew there with the names below. Uh, a fairly bare bones crew. Uh, one of the one of the limitations was that we could only uh, fit so many scientists. Uh, along with the um, relatively large number of people required to operate the uh, the ROV on on that particular cruise. Uh, so just as a, little, as a little bit of background, the the genesis for this cruise came about during a Maury scoping meeting about two years ago um, that that Doug was leading, and um, there was there was some discussion about what what types of of um, science cruises could be could be done with the the Maury the Maury program, uh, and I remember. Putting my hand up and saying, "Hey, we should do a deep sea corals cruise," and um, and Doug replied, "Great! If you can go and get some funding, then we'll we'll give you two weeks." Um, so that's what we did. We 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 assembled a a, a large group of of, of uh, PIs and collaborators uh, listed here, and we applied for an NSERC stack grant uh, entitled "Deepwater Coral Sponge and Sea Habitats Along the North Coast Atlantic Slope." Uh, pardon me, Shelf and Slope. Um, and we were successful. And I just want to point out, not not to be boastful, but rather to, I think, as a as an indicator of the uh, the, the the novelty and the, the strength of the the Mori concept, uh, the proposal was ranked first out of eleven applications in the twenty one competition. Uh, and as far as I know, it it um, uh, it, um, uh, it was awarded the highest highest amount from that that competition year. Uh, but that's not enough to fund a, a cruise. So we, we we secured additional money from uh, DFO grants and contributions agreement, uh, as well as past contributions from Neopar, the Geological Survey, uh, DFO, and Memorial University for a total funding package of 1.3 million. <clears throat> so the the heart of this cruise was. Uh, uh, or rather, this is a, a, a an ROV uh, centric cruise. Uh, so the ROV that was used uh, during the expedition was Oceaneering Magnum. Uh, this is a large, heavy work class ROV. Uh, it was equipped with five and seven man, uh, seven function manipulator arms, uh, forward and downward looking uh, HD video cameras, uh, a high definition stills camera, uh, a custom sampling skid, which I'll, I'll point out here. So Oceaneering was was very good at um, uh, designing and fabricating a, a custom skid. Uh, you can see it's in a re it's it's got the a, a drawer uh, retracted here. Um, uh, they they fabricated um, uh, uh, these slots for collecting biological samples, and also configured it so that we could collect uh, push core samples uh, affixed to the front of the skid. Uh, we also had streaming video so that our, our soar based science team could participate and help make decisions on the fly. Uh, and we had uh, navigational assistance from UTEC, which is a third party survey company. So here is our uh, expedition uh, uh, map. Uh, so it, it, just as a summary of our operations, we were at sea for 11 days total. Uh, we transited 825 kilometers. Uh, and in terms of our ROV operations, we visited nine stations and conducted 12 successful science dives, uh, over 100 hours of bottom time, uh, over 100, pardon me, 177 biological specimens collected and 22 uh, push cores collected uh, for onboard uh, experiments. 
uh, I just hi I'll highlight some of the stations that we chose were were um, uh, focused around uh, marine conservation areas such as, as the Emerald Basin Sponge Closure, um, the the Gully uh, Marine Protected Area, the Lophelia Coral Closure, uh, and Area 30 uh, over in Newfoundland waters. And in addition to the ROV operations, we conducted six CTD casts, uh, collecting 55 water samples. And we also attempted to gravity core at eight locations, um, but those were all uh, unsuccessful because of the coarse uh, gravelly substrate that we were coring into was not, it was just not conducive to, um, to gravity coring, unfortunately. So uh, Doug asked for this, for this symposium to focus on the science objectives. So I'm gonna go through uh, the ones that were successful and there, there, there are about eight of them. And the first of these was to extend the knowledge on the abundance distribution and diversity of deep water corals and sponges in previously un and underexplored areas. So I'll try to roll this video. This is a place called Portland Canyon. <clears throat> it's one of the most spectacular uh, places that we visited. Um, the geology here is quite, quite amazing. So we're looking at these vertical cliff uh, faces. They're actually these ridges. Um, they're composed of tertiary age, uh, semi-consolidated mudstones. And there's just an incredible diversity and abundance of, of coral and sponge life growing on the, on the upcurrent side of, of, these, um, of these ridges. So this wall, wall that I'm pointing out here is facing northward. Um, and and everywhere we looked in these canyon systems, the corals were always growing on the on the up current or north facing walls. Uh, this is a Paragorgia, this particular species. Uh, the the lasers are 45 centimeters apart, um, so you can appreciate these corals are on the order of one to two meters or even three meters in height. Uh, and an interesting thing about the zonation of these corals, we always see. Paragorgia growing at the top of the cliff faces and then different species as we go further and further down. Um, and in fact, this location was so spectacular that we came back towards the end of the cruise so we could do more uh, systematic sampling of, um, of different species growing along those uh, vertical cliff faces. Uh, another objective was to assess the effect and effect and pardon me, effectiveness of marine conservation efforts for protecting benthic biodiversity and ecological functioning. So many of these locations were visited uh, earlier, uh, in particular around about 2007, 2008, a number of video transects were completed with the ROPOS ROV. So our goal was to uh, re resurvey along the same line. So the, the black line here is um, uh, a transect from 2007. And then the purple line is our uh, our planned transect, um, and so we were actually able to 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 um, uh, recreate these transects very very well. Um, we haven't processed the video yet, but we have um, uh, close to 100 hours of of repeat video transect now that we plan to go through uh, and compare side by side to see how much change there has been in the um, uh, the amount, the size, the, the types of corals and other uh, benthic biodiversity that, that's growing in these areas uh, to assess whether uh, conservation efforts have been successful or not, and also to address some fairly fundamental questions about the biology of these, um, of these benthic communities. Uh, we also had the objective of collecting specimens for taxonomic identification, as well as reproductive and trophic ecology studies. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we collected quite a lot of specimens. There's an image just looking down at one of one of the halls from one particular dive, uh, a number of different coral coral and sponge species um, in the skid. Uh, number four, to collect uh, samples for use in paleo-oceanographic paleo proxy reconstructions. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, a species called Primnoa. Uh, it's from the Lophelia Conservation Area. Um, this particular specimen has been processed in the lab, um, pair of uh, postdoc Wilder Greenman. So you can see the beautiful growth rings in this um, in this specimen, um, and it's by by visualizing and then sampling across these growth rings that we can get retrospective uh, uh, geochemical reconstructions that we can then use to um, make interpretations about the changing environment over decades to centuries. Uh, number five is to investigate how in faunal and microbial 
biodiversity drive organic matter remineralization and nutrient cycling in continental marine margin habitats. Uh, so to that end, we collected uh, uh, 22 push core uh, 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 sediments. Um, after quite a lot of um, attempts, we, we finally got it down uh, closer towards the end of the cruise to where we were actually more successful. Uh, so this is uh, Chris Allegar's group leading this, this, um, this objective along with Paul Smellgrove. Uh, at Memorial, and there's a picture of um, Subidi Rakhit uh, uh, extracting and, and processing one of the cores in the onboard uh, laboratory. Uh, number six was to find uh, and recover settlement arrays deployed in 2007. Uh, so the picture on the left is one of the arrays from the Lophelia area that set a depth of 312 meters. We actually decided to leave that array in place so that we could revisit it in two, two years and see uh, how it has further been colonized by different um, uh, uh, different organisms. Um, also noteworthy on here, this this coral here is is Lophelia. It's a it's a rare um, uh, coral for this part of the Atlantic, um, and it's uh, it's nice to see it it's, it's vibrant and growing here. Um, the the rest of the area it, it gets its name. Um, uh, because of the, the the dead Lophelia rubble, and there's very few instances of live Lophelia, but here we see some beautiful uh, living Lophelia that we hope to see again in future years. Um, even more amazing was that we recovered settlement rates from much deeper in Newfoundland waters, up to 800 meters depth, um, without any searching whatsoever. So that speaks to the uh, incredible skill of the of the surveyors and able to in their ability to. Um, uh, 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 land us on on a on a point with with centimeter scale accuracy. Uh, the image on the right is from one of those those deeper arrays. You can see a, a small bamboo coral growing on the on a settlement block. Um, and so, um, uh, study of the organisms growing on these blocks will give us some constraints on how fast um, these organisms grow. Uh, another one was to assess the another objective rather was to assess long term coral and sponge recruitment patterns and recovery from trawling impacts. In 2007, we visualized a, a pretty clear and obvious uh, trawl scour, and we we intended to to revisit that. Uh, we think we landed on it, but it's not entirely clear if this was actually a trawl scour or scour or um, or some natural feature. Um, so we're still still trying to assess those data. Uh, and then lastly, we did some CTD cast to, um, uh, uh, to collect samples with the goal of determining intermediate water uh, carbon isotope distributions across the, the self slope transition. So that was fairly straightforward thanks to the, um, uh, the CTD uh, equipment that was installed with Maury. So that's it for the objectives. Um, a, a huge number of people to thank for the success of the cruise. I'll just end by, by stating that it was remarkably successful um, uh, in spite of quite a lot of logistical challenges, some of which Dan mentioned uh, towards the, uh, the, the, at the, uh, at the uh, beginning of the symposium. Um, uh, it, I'm, I, I'm highlighting a, a particular picture here um, and I wanna thank the, um, the crew of, of Oceaneering uh, particularly because uh, they proved to be just incredible at sea. Um, uh, one of the things that we didn't did not anticipate encountering was getting tangled up in fishing lines. So you can see in this image that the ROV is actually uh, hung up on on fishing line, um, and the pilots uh, were able to to uh, recover the ROV. Um, this happened again on three occasions, and they got better and better at just avoiding or uh, untangling from fishing line uh, uh, at depth. Uh, so we were incredibly impressed with the skill and the um, ability uh, and willingness of the ROV and the, and the ROV pilots themselves as well as the surveyors to, um, uh, to accommodate our needs and to meet our objectives. Um, I'll end there. If uh, anyone has questions, my contact information is provided here at the bottom. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Owen. That was an outstanding presentation. Uh, for, for me personally, it was, it was really quite interesting to see the diversity of the corals in depths exceeding 400 meters. And I do know that it's quite dark down there. So to see the different uh, uh, corals uh, growing was, uh, was really quite, quite amazing. It also sounds like there, there may be an opportunity to do some additional research in the uh, 
identification and recovery of ghost gear sounds like it was, <laughs> yeah. sounds like it was a real problem yeah it, it sure was every pretty much everywhere we we went we saw uh lots and lots of, of fishing rope um wow. so yeah okay well thanks again uh yeah. questions in the chat i think or is a question from doug just a oh, real yes. quick one. I at least think it's a quick one if there's time. So, and first of all, thanks. I mean, I, I can imagine you guys didn't sleep at all during that entire uh, expedition. <laughs> it, it looks that way. Um, but um, the question is, um, well, first of all, the fishing gear that tangled the art, that was in the marine protected area, I'm assuming. But uh, the second question, though, is did you see any clear evidence of um, trawling activity or was that hard to detect in general? That was hard to detect for two reasons the first of which on the on the nova scotia side we were in these deep canyons where they wouldn't have been falling these were all long line fishing areas uh, so what we did see was an awful lot of fishing fishing rope um strong all over the place uh it was pretty unbelievable actually and and particularly in the gully which is the the most protected of the places that we visited had i'd say far and away the most amount of fishing rope strong all over the place um, and it, it was often strung between sort of high points so that the, the rope you know between the high points if you were if you're kind of going up a little gully with the rov well you wouldn't see it until you'd already passed underneath it and then you'd get the, the tether hooked on it so that's what happened on three occasions including the one in that image that i showed on the newfoundland side uh, we were in pretty deep water uh, with pretty soft sediment so trawling, trawling would not necessarily leave an, an obvious scour uh, because there's just not, you know, it's, it's soft sediment that moves around a lot on its own. Um, and also what we observed was that the fish themselves really stir up a lot of sediment. Um, uh, a lot of flounder uh, moving a lot of sediment around. Uh, so even if there were trawl scours, I think they would be pretty hard to, to see. Uh, Barbara can weigh in on this probably more um, uh, later on in the, in the session, uh, but yeah, that's, that's about what we saw. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, it is my pleasure to introduce Ed Cregan. Ed Cregan was the chief scientist on board the Fatima cruise, which was our first cruise of 2022. <clears throat> and it was all about fog <coughs> investigation. So they certainly came to the right place. When not leading scientific cruises, Ed is a research engineer at the DEVCOM Army Research Facility in New Mexico. Over to you, Ed. Greetings, everyone, and welcome. I, I did this correctly. You can all see my presentation? Not yet. Oh, you have to click that blue button that says share, in fact. There you go. All righty. Uh, going to move through everything. I uh, want to start with the principles. This is a, the cruise was one component of a larger overarching project, but it's a fog and turbulence interaction in the marine environment. Uh, prior to this, we were up in the area coastally back in 2018, and this time we were returning for a more maritime or offshore approach. And uh, these are the principles. Uh, University of Notre Dame was the main uh, institution with this. The sponsor was the uh, Office of Navy Research down here. There's a list of people down below that were involved. Uh, quite a large number of people participating in this. A lot of people that were involved in the cruise directly, a lot of modeling, a lot of satellite people, operational meteorology. But when I get to Condor, which is, this is my picture I can visualize in my sleep. I can close my eyes and see this schematic anytime I choose to. But my main science groups, Notre Dame and NPS, Naval Postgraduate School, Dalhousie and York and Scripps. I've got Meopar on the side. 
and the ship, of course, is Atlantic Towing. That's the core of this effort itself. And that's where the uh, success came from. Overarching science, I just broke this out of a number of pages of uh, very technical documentation in the proposals. And the lead part of this is highlighted in yellow. Marine fog is one of the most difficult meteorological phenomenon to predict. Even though in terms of uh, looking at an annual perspective, the disruption to operations caused by marine fog is uh, on equivalence with that caused by severe weather. It just doesn't have the good public release. It doesn't make good media, so it's not reported that way, but it's a true statement. Scientifically, the difficulty we're facing here is the number of different scales that are involved in fog. Uh, this one says there are 15 decades of spatial scales from the bioaerosols on the nanometer up into the synoptic weather patterns, which are on thousands of kilometers in a global system. And add to that complexity that it is a truly an air-sea interaction. So it combines all of the atmospheric criteria and it, it, we're looking at how it couples and interacts with the ocean. So project expectation was breakthroughs in fundamental knowledge, the breakthroughs that would be translated into modeling capabilities over the entire fog life cycle. Down at the bottom is my update I put in from uh, yesterday afternoon. We finished in uh, August and the conference deadlines were actually occurring as we were out to sea. I have 12 presentations from various groups and that's actually underrepresented probably by a, an additional third, I was told. Research objectives, we had five of them. We had uh, hypotheses against all of these that we were testing. The first one was deploy leading edge instrumentation and novel measurement techniques. Some of the measurement techniques and the instrumentation utilization going on board the Condor is truly the first time it had ever been outside of a test lab, the first time it had actually been deployed and used operationally in for a scientific endeavor. And then we pushed that with number two, theoretical and numerical analyses, looking at turbulence as a nonlinear interaction between the fog droplets and the turbulence itself. Our third one is we wanted to examine the fog genesis and the cause of the vivid differences between low level clouds and fog. Number four was deficiencies in fog microphysical parameterizations for the numerical weather predictive models and to implement improvements. I insisted that we add the statement implement improvements. It's not enough to identify shortfalls. We have to be proactive and provide corrective and action and improvements in our modeling. And the last one was an optical propagation segment. We're focusing on fog interfering with uh, line of sight communication devices and things like that that are implemented. And this is what we did. I'm gonna start with this kind of in reverse order. We left Halifax, we had a layover in St. John's we went to Sable Island on your lower left. We went to the Hibernia platforms and worked on and off shelf up there in an intensive operational grid. And we had a Gulf Stream component, which is showed dropping off to the left. We were gone from the 4th of July. We returned on the 1st of August. We had 25, almost 26 days of data collection. And these are data collection for the bulk of these systems is 24 hour operations. Of that, I had 6.7 days that met our very tight scientific experts definition of fog. This is not a definition that a TV weather station would use in a forecast for you. This is a very precise and uh, very conservative definition of fog. When I was in, to give you a flavor, when I was up in uh, 2018 doing the coastal study, I had five data sets to analyze for fog events. And those, the scope of those were measured in hours, not days. 
So this is an incredible rich data set that uh, the estimate has now moved out for a three-year analysis window from my uh, much larger group of people who are doing analysis and simulation. We covered about 5,600 kilometers over this measurement cycle. And even though fog was my focus, all of this data is useful. The intercomparisons, the different weather events, even the clear, it's all part of a larger data analysis program. These are some highlights of uh, close. Up one on the left is Sable Island, which was also instrumented in support of this cruise. And then the one on the right is the onshore offshore out by the Hibernia oil field platform. All of those marks indicate a multi-hour deployment of uh, manually operated equipment, both going over the side into the ocean and going up into the atmosphere. And so that gives you a scope of what was going on, the uh, density of the uh, high resolution measurements that we were doing. And then in addition to all of that and to cruising and measuring as we went, we had four primary areas or uh, events to focus on specifically. If these events were occurring, we would deviate from the ship track and the cruise planning to accommodate specific collections in these documented areas. Uh, for extended fog case, which was more over by Hibernia, we would either hold in position to remove the ship's uh, motion from the uh, measurement cycle, or we would uh, stay in, uh, we would try to stay in one track and we would actually move both ways. So we would have one which was for spatial variability reduction and the other one which was for uh, time to remove the uh, temporal measurements. So the measurements were constant and not interfering. Both of them combined, we could do one for a number of hours and then do another one was a bonus that we hadn't anticipated and the modeling community on our project was highly excited to see. The other two we did was a dissipation event or if we had a boundary that we could move in and out of that we could actually relocate the ship from a fog event outside to clear and then back in. All of these events were in, very intensive. We uh, increased the pace and timing of all measurements in these events. So when I say measurement cycle, this is the condor and this is what we brought to put in. I had so many different groups coming in. Uh, I can assure you this document right here would cause any research fleet operations group to stop and lean back in their chairs and immediately start asking for clarifications and questions. This is an unprecedented level of instrumentation going on to a vessel. And it does any research vessel, full-blown permanent research fleet was going to stop and take a step back for this one. We are instrumenting from the very top of the crow's nest coming down through, we modified it for Monkey's Island. That is a uh, Captain Bennett and the ship's crew's name for the wheelhouse roof. We bow mast to the stern, over the side, into the air, autonomous vessels that were deployed for the entire period. Some were picked up and dropped off at Wicks, complementing the ship's measurements. Others were left at Sable Island for the month. This gives you a scope of instrumentation. Many of these instruments are generating multiple data sets, multiple data points. They're measuring multiple things simultaneously. So even if you see that number there, I'm getting multiple uh, data sets from most of these instruments. Uh, some of them are like I have radar systems and uh, LIDAR systems, laser systems. They're, so they're profiling up anywhere on the order of uh, hundreds of meters up to a kilometer range systems. I'm launching tree flying weather balloons that are going up 20 kilometers or more on their mechanisms. I'm going into the ocean all the way down to the shelf surface. It's a mind boggling array of uh, instrumentation. This is a kind of a different picture. It gives you a more of a visual. The larger background picture is actually a GoPro camera off the tethered lifting system, which is flying here, probably about 300 meters above the surface. 
This is Gulfstream operations, which is why we have a nice clear day for it. The balloon system implemented a stabilized platform that looked upward and downward. This is one of the systems that was the first time ever deployed in this kind of an environment. And then we have things hanging over the side. If you look on the right, I'll get into it a little bit more. There's a large square box coming in and out. That was quite a challenge. That was the ship crew and the crane operation, my deck crew just embraced. We have instrumentation and every piece of it. If you look, you saw this is a poster child for Dan's presentation where you have the four cargo vans that are the lab vans. I have a each corner aft, I have a 20 foot shipping container from meal par with a platform on top of it that gives me my scanning for horizontal scanning, gets me the height, gets me outside that three meter wall. That's what you're looking at in the lower left where it says cloud radar and wind lidar. And additionally, those systems are both operating inside stabilized platforms that correct in real time for ship uh, pitch and roll, which is something that's not uh, common. That's a custom, another custom built instrumentation. But that gives you a scope, just a very quick overview of what level of instrumentation we did. More of a line schematic shows you the higher end. People climbed up there, made, put those on, they ran. There's cabling from all of this going into lab vans, going into the bridge. This is the Monkey Island. This is the roof of the bridge. And then uh, this is probably my cornerstone of impressive operations. Uh, when I first put this out to uh, Dan and uh, Scott and Greg Rodrigo over at Mealpar. I was fearful that they would simply shake their head and leave the table or would laugh. Either way, I wasn't concerned. But what we did is we had some laboratory based aerosol sampling equipment that resides, it's hundreds of pounds of equipment. It resides in five foot tall computer racks, it runs vacuum pumps that are in 24 hour operation. And I said, we need to put these on the bridge. And I didn't say that initially, people came to me, the scientists came to me and said, this needs to go on the bridge. It needs to be inside. It is not ruggedized equipment. This is research grade equipment coming out of the lab. And we, so we proposed it, uh, it was accepted as, yeah, we can do this. And when I showed up on the ship, not only did they do it, but they let me modify it on the fly. They put the structure in to support the massive, massive uh, computer racks, and they let us add additional information into that. Half of the research vessels I've been involved in, this proposal would have been no, just would have been an instant firm hard no, because the bridge is the command center of the vessel. So you have some really unique and special capabilities between Mealpar and vessels like the Condor that expanded my scope and my capabilities far beyond what I was actually ex expecting going in. And so this is something I will be remembering for quite some time. This is a real, a real feather in the research data collection side of our cap. Aft, we have a, a huge A-frame deck. We have 20 foot uh, shipping containers for storage with custom built platforms on top of them. We have the four lab vans. We have the CTD deck. The CTD had the fresh paint smell when we got to use it. We had autonomous vessels that were moved in and out. We're using every square meter of the Condor from the very top to the very front, all the way to the aft. Sensors that we used underway, these were ones that we operated while the ship was in motion. This is just a rough measure, just to give you an idea of what we're doing is as we're in motion, this is, this is collected constantly. Every time we stopped at one of those data collection points, these are ones that ran uh, under operation. We, we had a VMP, a micro profiler that operated out of the A-frame, multiple casts every time you stopped CTD, operated off of the side out of the new CTD container, multiple cast every time it was stopped. The TLS is that balloon system that flies on tether, multiple flights, C cams, which is crane profiling off the other opposite side of the CTD, 
multiple profiles. That's probably an hour worth of profiling every time you stop. And then we had wave gliders, a sea worker vessel, about the size of a full-size pickup truck. And we deployed one shallow mall, excuse me, shallow water mooring uh, just near Sable Island at the beginning and we picked it up at the end. So we did some mooring work on the shelf. I wanna go into these two real quick. The people sitting in the galley on the right are uh, just the science crew. I have NPS and York, I have Dalhousie, I have Notre Dame, all sitting there looking at their laptops, going through data realistically when they probably should be sleeping. It's probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. But these researchers formed collaborations during the cruise, talking and discussing science in a way that would never have happened had they not been on the cruise. We had a full complement. I had uh, 15 people. We had every berth filled going both ways. And oh, Scripps, I left out Scripps, my other group that was there, that was on. And this is a model result that came out during the cruise. Uh, that's Sable Island right in here. And this is the fog event all around that's forecast, the red is fog. We have that white clear spot that's in the lee of the Sable Island. So on the fly, after a two o'clock meeting with all of my forecasters, we went with what we called SLOP, which is the Sable Lee observation period. We broke out of our pattern, took opportunistic approach to some science, and we actually got the condor into position overnight to come down through this from the top as it was evolving toward us, measuring it all the way in close. And then we worked transects east and west. And we actually measured the evolution of that event. Fortuitously, Sable Island was heavily instrumented and the condor was incredibly instrumented. And that was the only time that level of instrumentation has been applied to this phenomenon. That research is still being conducted. Those people are still going through all of that. It'll be fascinating to see the results. Things that go on, uh, on the left, I have a radio song launch, a free flying weather balloon. These operations went constantly. This, this launch right now is being done at 3 a.m. In the other two slides is the CAMS. This is a custom built first ever use of a ensemble of instrumentations with a very specific profiling function from the surface up to about uh, 15, 20 meters. This was used, was going to be done on the white crane. White crane had a mechanical problem and wasn't available. So we went to the smaller ship crane to use it. The ship operator, uh, mostly Rob Gould, is running this crane and he's operating this equipment, profiling it for us over radio link. And he can't see it at the lower levels. So he is working with the science team, working with the other deck hands and profiling this system for an hour of crane operations. And we actually would lower that to within, in conditions like the center video, we would lower that to within a half meter of the surface. He's moving it, not keeping it wet right here. It's just, just getting down. We're trying to keep that bob off. Uh, you can see on the right-hand picture that the fog is more dense and the ocean is uh, more agitated. You see the white capping. Still operated that hours at a time, hour at a time. And that's uh, just an incredible amount of work for all involved. But impressive train operations, impressive uh, ship operations working with these people on the Condor. This is research vessel Wallace. First time we'd ever deployed it from Scripps that we'd ever moved it off uh, a vessel. Typically they launched it from the shore. It's a heavily instrumented autonomous vessel, uh, roughly about 3,800 pounds. This is it going in the water. The picture over here on the right is about 400 meters off the side of the condor. We operated it in conjunction with the condor's operations. It was doing a one kilometer circle about the condor as we moved and then we brought it in and recovered it. So this is another first for us, another excellent system, heavily instrumented. Wave gliders, my other autonomous system, 
we ran five of these. Uh, some of them worked around Sable Island for the entire month after we launched them. Others went with us for week long uh, missions over by Hibernia. This is the crane operation it takes to get it in and out. And that's one on the left as it's going off on its uh, cheerful, happy way. A wonderful data set, a wonderful opportunity to move this many around the vessel and in the area you're scanning. Uh, some conditions on the left, the bow mast is being obscured from the bridge. This is on a clear day, you've got a nice rainbow in there, but we did take weather, we did take some seas. The picture on the right is the tethered balloon system tied down on its docking station. And this is the aft deck. This is about the available real estate that was left over. As you can see, we're using pretty much everything that was available. I'd like to finish up with uh, my, my ship crew. This is the end of the entire cruise. This is after we're uh, demob. The people on the, that are in the hard hats are the science crew that were pulling equipment off and doing crane ops. The other people who came down and joined us are from Atlantic Towing Ship Crew. Uh, everybody from the bridge crew to the deck hands and the, uh, the cook all came down to get in the picture. Incredible group project, if you want to view it that way, to do this level of science. And my dolphin spectators on the left, that happened out by near Hibernia. And so I will go ahead and wrap up there. And I just cannot say thank you enough uh, from Dan and everybody from Milpar, from the Atlantic Towing people, to put this together and to coordinate it and pull it off was really quite quite impressive treat for me. Because as I said, the level and sophistication of what we were attempting would have been a stretch and a challenge for any research vessel operating any place in the world today. And to be able to do it with the Condor, uh, I think fully validates the concept that you can do substantial level to work on tight timelines. And it was really, we have three years worth of data analysis and minimum coming out of this uh, project. And I have people that uh, con constantly are in contact with me, uh, get, getting clarifications and details, but the feedback I get from my larger community group has been truly outstanding. So go ahead and end there, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, that, thank you for the compliments. And I have to say on behalf of the entire Miopard group, it was a real pleasure with working with your team and having the opportunity to work with such a complex mission. Very, very, very exciting indeed. And very happy to hear that uh, you'll be keeping your team as well as I'm sure many other people busy for the next three years with all the data collected. Oh. Well, well, certainly when you need more data, we'll be looking forward to seeing your group again. Good. But in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, um, if you could just send those to, to me in, in the chat box and, and maybe we could answer them a little later because we are running a wee bit short on time. Uh, that was an outstanding presentation. And I think if we kept it to 10 minutes, it really wouldn't have done the cruise justice. So thank you very much, Ed. But now I will hand over control of the meeting to our... Uh, to Mia Pars, um, Scientific Director, Dr. Doug Wallace, who will lead our panel discussion. Doug. Well, yeah, I just want to echo my thanks to all of the uh, presenters, actually. Um, in one second, sorry. <laughs> Apologies about that. <laughs> just had a knock at my door. Okay. So, um, yeah, to all of the presenters and all the, all the participants on the cruises, it's um, the, the goal was to show what the level of um, diversity and sophistication of the work uh, that was done uh, with Maury uh, and with the ship. I think that came across, especially thanks to Ed's presentation. Thank you, Ed. And especially what can be done by a Canadian crew on a Canadian ship. I, I really think all the participants uh, felt that both with the ROV teams and 
and also especially with the ship's crew that um, uh, a lot of um, flexibility, engagement, and interest uh, was shown. So, so in a way, Ed has sort of um, presented what this panel discussion is meant to be about. And I, I think it's about the future. Uh, it's about the future. I think all of us, or certainly those of us in Atlantic Canada, know uh, that in January of this year, the, the, the Coast Guard um, uh, ship Hudson um, uh, was uh, went into retirement, let's put it that way, and that this, um, this was our premier vessel on the East Coast for uh, since 1964. Um, a long time. And the opportunity of that retirement was an opportunity to look back a little bit. And a lot of people did look back and all the wonderful work that was done on that vessel and the amazing scientific progress that was made by uh, by people who sailed on it. Um, but also, um, you know, noting that 1964, that's when the Hudson came into operation. You know, I came into operation only five years before that. That's a long, long time ago. And um, the time is now to look in the future. And the National Research Vessel Task Team took the opportunity of that event, where we're celebrating the retirement of, of one vessel, to call for a national discussion, an urgent national discussion about the future. What are we going to do next? And I think some of the ideas of what we're going to do next were in these presentations we just heard. Um, so now, now is the chance to look forward a, a little bit. And in the panel discussion, um, we're going to ask the panelists to look forward as best they can, maybe over the next decade, two decades, maybe even three decades, in, in terms of what type of what will vessels be used for, why are vessels important, what type of science will we be doing at sea uh, in the future. And um, we've sort of selected um, a pat the panelists quite deliberately with that in mind, you know, as the presentations about the cruises were covered many, many different disciplines, you know, ranging from atmospheric science through ocean science to studies of the sea floor and, and, and uh, biodiversity and molecular biology. And that's the kind of way we're going to uh, structure the panel uh, as well, looking forward, because that is the diversity of ocean related research, not ocean science, but ocean related research uh, we're, we're going to do. So what I'd like to do, first of all, um, is maybe just um, start off by asking the panelists themselves to very briefly um, introduce themselves. Um, and uh, if it's OK, I'll start. And I'm just going to ask you each just to say your name and uh, maybe put your cameras on and um, say your name, you know, where you work and what type of research discipline uh, you're representing. So maybe if it's OK, I'll start. Um, out west this time and go to as far west as we're going with this panel anyway. Uh, I think that's Casey. Casey? Hi, thanks, Doug. Uh, I'm actually here in Canmore with Jackie Zoris and, and about 20 other colleagues. So so the meal car event coincided with our um, our science team workshop. And uh, and so I work with Jackie, so, so the presenter of the DNA sequencing on, on the Atlantic Condor. And uh, together with uh, St. Mary's University, where Todd Ventura is based in Halifax, and, and our group at the University of Calgary, we've been uh, using the Hudson that you just mentioned, um, um, and other ships, and most recently the Atlantic Condor on the on the very first uh, Bori expedition in August 2021. So um, we're very happy uh, with that uh, successful expedition. Thanks for the chance to join the panel. Okay, thanks, Casey. And then I think we'll go, yeah, we'll go a little bit east uh, to Faye. Faye. Hi, everyone. Fei Wen uh, from the Maritime Province of Manitoba. I always say that because people are <laughs> otherwise wondering why. So I'm an environmental chemist by training, primarily working contaminants uh, in the Arctic marine and sea ice uh, system. Uh, and I'm a funding member of the Arctic Net, uh, so has used uh, the Amazon for most of my career. And most recently, UFM called on a research vessel called the William Kennedy. And I think the main reason that uh, that Doug got me here is because he knows I'm in desperate need to find the vessels not for the next three decades, but for the next few months. So I will stop there. Thanks, Faye. And then we'll go um, back to Halifax here and uh, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Chang. I'm at Dalhousie University. I'm also an atmospheric scientist, um, and I'm interested in particles in the marine environment, in um, water, water areas, but also in the Arctic. 
And uh, yeah, that's probably it now. That's it for now, but we'll come back to that. Dasha, of course you've uh, presented earlier, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah. Reiterate. I'm an ocean biogeochemist and uh, involved in observation of the water column and the water column air interface. And uh, my experience um, in Canada going to sea has been exclusively on um, foreign research vessels until last year, where I had the opportunity to actually deploy the moorings on a Canadian vessel for the first time. Thanks, uh, Dasha. And then we'll end up, uh, I think you're in, uh, in St. John's, Barbara, are you? That's right. Hi, I, I'm Barbara Nevis. I'm a research scientist with DFO, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, based in Newfoundland. And I work on benthic ecology, mostly on corals and sponges, and I'm very interested in anything related to the seafloor. And I was part of the leg that Owen presented uh, on the corals and sponges. And so um, a lot of my experiences in, in Coast Guard vessels, but I've been in other vessels too, and that was my first experience in the Condor. Glad to be here. Okay, thanks everybody and uh, for joining. And as I say, this is uh, meant to, in many ways meant to be the initiation of what we hope will be a national discussion about vessel infrastructure uh, in Canada, what it'll be used for, what type of vessels we need, why we need it, who needs it, so we've got a, we had a few questions kind of lined up uh, to which uh, different panelists sort of signed up to say some words about. I think we're just going to launch right into it. The, the first one um, related to, it's kind of a com multiple question and the panelists may just choose to ask one bit of it, um, but the question relates to what would have happened to your group or your project's research goals if the Mori uh, uh, demonstration project had not taken place over the last couple of years? Or, or what's the status of your research group's access to the ocean for research logistical support at sea? And how does it affect the science you do? Or, especially for early career researchers, is access to ship time important? And does it, uh, is it important for uh, your career development and how uh, your research can go forward in comparison, possibly in competition or collaboration with your peers. So I, I think, Rachel, you um, signed up to address at least one of those uh, questions. Yeah, right? I, I can address a few of them, I guess. As an atmospheric scientist, actually, there's seems like limited opportunities to access ship time. And so to be honest, like when I started here, even though I was hoping to have some access, I basically planned my entire research program as if I wouldn't have ship access because it's not, it's, it's actually very rare. It seems like I think Faye is maybe one of the few people who've like consistently gotten uh, ship time, but most atmospheric scientists access ship time by um, like sudden pots of money that allows them to do like targeted, um, targeted measurements or somebody has a birth that you can take advantage of. And so it's not something you can plan your research career around. Um, and so I've been very lucky actually since I arrived at Dal that I've had opportunities on American ships and Canadian ships and Swedish ships to go to sea, but they were all like ship, uh, opportunity for like, uh, what, do you, what do you call this? Like birth of opportunity. Like I did not really plan for them. Somebody was just like, Oh, we have a spot. Do you want to come? Basically, and and I said yes because if you don't say yes, you don't get to go. And so, as an early career researcher, you know it's obviously difficult to plan your research program, a cohesive research program, if you're always just like randomly getting on a random ship in a random place of, the, of in the world. Um, so that makes it difficult. Also, like I I think if I'd like to think that if I had more access, then I could eventually become like a chief scientist on board one of these ships, but I can't take that leadership role if I don't have um, the, the preparation time um, or a preparation in advance of that. Uh, I think that that's... Do you see that as being different for you, Rachel, compared to your colleagues in other countries? Oh, that's a good question. I think my colleagues in the US, for example, who have more like easier access to ship time, I, I think, um, I think that they would have an advantage, yeah. Okay, so, you know, in, we can come back to that, I think. Um, and if any other panelists want to jump in, you're not restricted to what you said you'd sign up, <laughs> up to. Um, 
But the um, next question related more to the future, and, and, and this is one that I think is discussed in, 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 in various uh, organizations, is do you um, see a need for continued access to research vessel capacity or seagoing capacity for research for the next 10 to 30 years in your research area? Or can everything be shifted over in that time frame? over to using, for example, autonom autonomous vehicles, un unmanned vehicles, excuse the terminology there, but we don't really have another one at the moment. Um, or will we still require access to ships and vessels like that? So I think um, on that one, um, we had uh, actually quite a few people. I'll start with Dasha and then maybe Barbara, uh, uh, no, Faye and then Barbara. Thanks, Doug. This question actually quits, uh, hits home. Um, so uh, as, as you've seen just from demonstration crews that we had is that reliance on autonomous vehicles doesn't exclude the need for the ship time. It's just the different kind of ship time is needed. We need more flexibility for rescue missions or for the platforms that do not go that far offshore uh, we need to deliver them offshore for them to continue their work out there. So coming back also to the uh, value chain and observation uh, and the, the pyramid that I showed is that um, we do not, we simply do not substitute the measurements that we've done, we, we've done before and on the research vessels with the new measurements. We just add in more to our knowledge database. We expand in our foundation of this value chain. Um, so I, and, and you know, um, anyone who is deploying instruments out there would know that in theory, it, it sounds like you can just deploy the instrument and then send it back home and it will, it will come by itself. But in reality, um, and some faults happening and the instrument stopped working. So uh, the, there always need to be a contingency plan where we need to come and rescue the, the, the platform, pick it up. So um, yeah, and shortly, I do not expect that we'll um, get rid of the need for the ship time at all, but it will just shift in a different plane um, of, of use. Thanks, Dasha. Um, maybe over to Faye. I think you had uh, some thoughts on this, right? Yeah, so I have a few comments here. Like Rachel mentioned that uh, I was among the lucky few that uh, for most of my research career so far had uh, relatively uh, easier kind of access to ships. I had uh, the Amazon to thank for. I saw Alexander Forrest here, right? So back in the early, if we go back to uh, early 2000s, and we were in an even more desperate <laughs> position than we are right now. Back then, there was essentially none, right, for the Arctic research to take place in this country. And it's really kudu cool to the scientific community across the country and the leadership of, uh, of quite a few that many of you are aware that we were lucky at that time to get the Amazon going. And that for many of us, we thank for that really supported our career. So I think we're right now at a stage where we need to revisit, right? At this time, 20 years later, and uh, what's the future need is, are we kind of at a, at a, at a, at a, a, a position where we could just continue what we have and we need to do something different. In terms of the ship needs, definitely as an environmental chemist, as somebody working on contaminants in the marine system, as much as we like to do everything by remote sensing, by ROVs, AUVs, right? And unfortunately, well, fortunately, the contaminants in most of the waters, the concentrations are extremely low. We don't have sensors that could actually do the real time measurement. So I think in the foreseeable future, we're going to continue to continuously rely on physical, physically collecting samples. Very often we need to process those samples and sometimes measure those samples right on, on site. And that means we need the vessel to support that, right? And even for the AUVs, ROVs, we, they do need to be deployed from vessels. So I do see that the need will continue. And especially given the traffic projection for the high Arctic, as well as uh, from the North Atlantic and North Pacific, of course, vessels has to go somewhere. With the sea ice condition as such, that uh, we do project a dramatic increase in shipping activities, let alone other resource development uh, processes. So associated with that, you will definitely see a lot of opportunities and 
problems from contaminants point of view, right? I'm dealing with both the legacy contaminants and as well as emerging contaminants. And one of the things, of course, is oil spill. So with those kind of activities, you definitely see there will be not small need for a ship-based study to look at the ship-related contaminants itself, as well as for other contaminants. So I do see that's a, 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 a if anything, that will only increase. So again, so there are a lot of opportunities that we could do potentially with new technology. We don't have to use vessels, but I think most of the study, a lot of studies that we're doing will continue to rely on, on vessel related support. So I, yep. I think I will stop here and we'll just let other people chip in, but I can chat a bit more. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Faye. I mean, so, you know, what you're saying is um, continued need, possibly increased need. And uh, I think that's an echo we hear in many other disciplines as well. Move over to Barbara, and then I'm going to go to um, Casey uh, on this one as well. Barbara? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I guess my colleagues said the same thing that I was thinking, and it's very clear that we do need, um, if anything, we need more vessels over, you know, over time. I think in my field, so I'm working on the benthos, uh, we do need to go see and, you know, our samples on the seafloor. We need to collect them. Uh, we need to, you know, photograph them, make videos of them, and I don't think there is any technology yet that can just go on its own. So I, I, I do see that, you know, over time, um, our technologies are changing, but not at that point. So, for example, if we do a lot of uh, ROV surveys or any other types of camera surveys, over time, in the next decades, uh, the camera systems are going to improve, probably. And we can do maybe different things than what we're doing now, but we still need the vessels to have access to the sites and to conduct our science. So. Yeah, and that that makes sense, uh, Barbara. And then um, I think um, you know this is actually maybe an issue for uh, Rachel as well from thinking about climate uh, research. I mean, I know you know you're an atmospheric scientist, but for climate research and the need to understand what's going on on processes similar to what Ed was talking about where do you see uh, the do you see the need um, diminishing or increasing I mean increase I think I think to be realistic right there's probably an underestimate of the current need first off and then secondly I think you know there's all these technologies all the technologies that are autonomous now were developed I don't know, like 20 years ago, let me estimate. Whatever we do now might be auto automated in 20 years, but there, we will develop new technologies. That's what we do, right? We want to measure new things, ask new questions. I think that um, what I see as a general need in the next probably now and in the future is that there's regular measurements that you want to be doing, kind of like your, I don't know if you call it Sentinel or like uh, regular transects where you're measuring what the, what the values are, which for atmospheric science, in like the North Atlantic, we do not have regular measurements. That is like the remote, the remote, we can't validate or evaluate the satellites if we don't have surface measurements. And that's something that's missing right now. Um, there's all sorts of issues with retrieving things over the ocean. And, and if you don't have that surface uh, evaluation validation, then it's useless. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say useless. Uh, for my remote sensing colleagues. Um, and then the other thing is these intensive studies where you can put in lots and lots of instruments to study specific questions uh, at once. And I don't foresee that disappearing. I think we will always have interesting questions that we want to ask. And there will be always regular measurements that you want to make um, as a baseline. And I think that you know there, there are two different types of ship access that we would want. And I don't foresee that decreasing in the future. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for that. And I think that was made very clear in obviously in Ed's presentation there. Um, as well about the complexity, the growing complexity of the type of science we have to do uh, over the ocean uh, as well uh, with uh, uh, studying processes at the at multiple scales, for example. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to move on to the next general question, which is a little bit more in the looking back, but looking back in order to look forward, right? So, you know, we had a pretty busy two years with the Mori project. Um, <laughs> it was pretty big. I mean, I think we know that not everything worked perfectly. It was hardly surprising. Um, had a bit of bad luck with weather sometimes, but it was also always intended. We knew that would, to be honest, we knew that would happen. You know, we knew everything wouldn't go smoothly. And um, I'm not saying you're all guinea pigs, but yes, you're all guinea pigs to some extent. So um, 
uh, the idea was to learn by doing and to and to you know to learn by doing so that we can get better so i guess the next question really is were the lessons that you learned about the use in this case of a pretty non-conventional research vessel i mean it's not a research vessel it's just a regular ship um during uh, during your experiences at sea on the Condor, and uh, were the lessons learned that we should uh, take into account for the future? I think, Barbara, you had some ideas on that. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I was in, in last summer in the leg, like I said, right, with um, Owen and the team doing the seafloor surveys. And I think one lesson is it works. <laughs> Right, so um, it was good to see that using the containers as our labs that worked well, that the industry crew was very willing to, you know, participate with us. Everybody was very excited. They would never say no to our requests and uh, all of that. So that side of working with industry was very good. It worked very well. Uh, working with the ROV pilots, you know, was a different company. This is something that was a little bit new to us. It's like the so many different pieces, right? So we, we're working with uh, the ship itself, the, the company dealing with the ship, and then we're working with you guys in your part, and we're working with the ROV operators, we're working with the navigation company. So it's uh, many different pieces, and we were very happy with everybody, uh, you know, the, the quality of the work that we, we got. Uh, but I think a few things that we learned, you know, about using a vessel like that is small things that we compare to other vessels that we have done research in, right? So um, one example for us in our group was, like Owen mentioned, was the limitation in the number of people that could be aboard. And I, I was actually observing the presentations by my other colleagues and, and thinking how it's interesting how different groups have different needs. And in our case, having the need to use the ROV was a limitation in a sense, because that alone needed, what, six ROV pilots, which means that we had six less science members, right? Uh, and then other colleagues that did not need the ROV maybe wouldn't have that problem. And then for them, it was a little bit, you know, smoother having doubled the crew. Um, so that's for sure that for us, you know, there was one lesson learned, uh, you know, in the future, I think we would consider that uh, having more people is essential because like, you know, you said, though, it's uh, doing 24 hour operation with the seven, eight people, right? It can be quite uh, uh, challenging, you know, we are all passionate and we love it, but it does at some point it limits the, the, even the type of work we can do. It's not just the amount, right? Like you have less expertise and then you can do um, less of, of the work that you would love to do or that you would have the opportunity if you had more people aboard at that location. Um, so another thing that I think we learned that it's uh, going to be probably bad in the future is the communication, how that is so, so critical that we communicate well, that we are all on the same page about you know, the equipment that we bring in the ship, both sides, right? That we can fully understand uh, what we're doing so that we avoid you know, um, issues in terms of just uh, not having enough communication. But I think uh, in terms of you know, the, the, the lessons was some small things uh, that would make you know, future expeditions in this type of scenario better. Uh, like I said, the communication, you know, before with uh, the whole team, but also communication in the ship, we found that uh, that is so important. And sometimes we take it for granted. It's just, you know, having that platform to have communication so that we can talk to the team and say what's going on and talk to the, the crew and say what's going on. And um, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's something that you might not think about, but it's so, so crucial. So I think that's uh, some of the things I had in mind for this. I don't know if anybody else has other thoughts. Yeah, thanks, uh, Barbara. And we're, we are going to capture these lessons learned, right? But, but uh, Casey, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, there, were, there were certainly lessons learned. Um, as, as, um, but, but I would emphasize that I, uh, you know, using a platform for the, for the very first time, I was expecting uh, more hiccups, and I think I, I think our team was was very happy with with how it all went. Um, um, that might have might have been some good luck, but I think it was um, um, you know we we really appreciated that opportunity to. I, I think the communication we did have in advance, Dan with with Dan Gibson and, and Greg uh, Sadal at, at Mopar. Um, I mean, a lot of effort went into it from our side, from from Mari's side, and. Um, 
and it, I think it was quite successful. Um, you know, we'd love to have had more people on board. I think that's a lesson all of the, um, probably all of the teams, at least with the Condor, have have learned because you see the potential of a platform like this, and, and you and you want to add another, you know, Lego block to the to the back of the Condor because you can. But then that might that Lego block might need someone to operate, uh, you know, a specialized person, and then, you know, there were there were limited berths. Um, so so um, I see a lot of potential. I I think. Um, to, to your previous question, of course, we 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 have three oceans. We we need to be doing a lot of of work at sea, and I think this this platform um, is great. I, I I think you can think about lessons, you know, for that ship for the Condor, um, as well as lessons for the broader uh, concept of Mori. But I th I think it's an important piece of the puzzle looking forward. Um, I also have to jump off, but I appreciate uh, appreciate the session this morning and. And um, wishing Maury all the best, and, and look forward to collaborate as as it evolves and improves. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. And and I know a lot of people have to leave. We are over time, so we're going to wrap this up with the last um, uh, question, which is just really a general one. Really, are there any other comments or suggestions about the situation with respect to the planning of ship time and our future plans um, that any panelists want to make? And you know, I'm wondering about you, Faye, in the situation you're in right now, right? Um, are there lessons we should be learning and things we should be uh, doing? What do you think? Yeah, I will try to be brief. So some of you are aware that I'm uh, right now leading this major field trial, oil spill field trial research offshore Newfoundland uh, proposed to uh, take place next summer. And it's not like we're waiting for the last minute to plan for next summer. We are actually in this process for a good five years, but they took a long time to get the um, uh, ministerial approval. Finally, we got approval, and then now we have to do it within the next few months, right? It was easy. And I'm not losing hope yet. We still got some, some opportunities, but um, with the, doing that process and uh, why we talk about earlier success and so on, and I've been kind of thinking about how do we move forward as a community. So I think the, to me that we cannot just rely on government uh, vessels, right? In this specific case, Coast Guard vessels are not eligible or allowed to be participating in this kind of research. We cannot just um, rely on universities. And in Canada, we don't really have many universities who own their own research vessel. So I think the future has to be a consortium of parts as partner between universities, between governments, and between private sector and uh, NGOs, right? So I think it's, that's really the way to go. And then um, and the, so from that perspective, it's more redesigned that you have these uh, modules that could go with research vessel or with um, a, a supply vessel. And that's a perfect idea of uh, going forward. So increasingly, I think we have to rely on this uh, ships of opportunity program, so you, which can, whatever vessels happen to be transiting in those uh, water, and we could put our instruments on. So I think that Mori, it's it, it's perfect for that that idea. This partnership between university and uh, private uh, and and the organizations. A good example is the UFM's vessel now. It's not really our own, but it's called the William Kennedy. It's really come to being because of uh, the partnership involving Canada Foundation for Innovation, University of Manitoba, and the Arctic Foundation. So all the three parties have put resources together maintaining this vessel it's not exclusively UFMs, but we do have uh, some priority of uh, accessing it so i think that that kind of a consortium approach in uh, involving multiple partners from different sectors and make our, ourselves as module as flexible as possible is probably the best way to go to go forward so i want to congratulate of course doug for your vision to develop something like this and uh, the question is how do we eventually kind of a uh, make this 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 uh, going forward. So it's just a few thoughts that I've been thinking this over the last while. No, well, that's very. I, I think we have to. Unfortunately, I think we have to finish up the session. I think it's been amazing, to be honest. And maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's been an amazing, an interesting session. I think your points at the end there, Faye, probably sum up what a lot of us feel: is partnership, consortia, flexibility. Um, and I think we've got some good, good models. I mean, it's not like you know, we have good models to look at, you know, as you mentioned, William Kennedy, the Amundsen, the Amundsen Science, we've got really good models, but how do we make the whole thing work for, for Canada? So uh, this is just the start of the discussion, but I think it's been a pretty good discussion and fairly optimistic. 
recognizing we're not out of crisis mode yet, no, right? I mean, I know you're in a crisis mode and several other groups are as well. So we've got to keep the discussion going and actually uh, get stuff done. I'd like to thank everybody, um, all the speakers, um, starting with Dan, but going through all the presentations and the panelists for your thoughts. And uh, this is not the end of the discussion. That's the main point. Thanks. Handing over to you, Isabel. Thank you. <laughs>